Good afternoon everyone. Guys, wild times we're living in. Right, okay, so this afternoon's video, well, what time is it? It's probably going to be afternoon by the time you guys see it. We're going to talk about this situation that's unfolding in Ukraine. I honestly thought the Russians would have been able to make a push through that, but for information I've seen online, I'm not so sure now, and I'll come on to that afterwards, guys. And the information I'm going to give you, it's not confirmed. It's not in the mainstream. This is just what I've been shown through back channels and other online sources. We're also going to talk about Iran and Israel and why that thing now is inevitable to go to the next level. Also, the UK water supply is back in the news and the dastardly tricks that those guys have been playing. And also, more escal... More escalations in the Falklands, but kind of not escalations, but they're going to lead to further escalations, as I will point out. Guys, as always, if you've not done so already, please like and subscribe and hit the buttons below, whatever whatever the buttons they are, if you want. I would really appreciate that. Anyway, so we're going to start and lead with what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. So... For, the, for those of you who don't know, Ukraine has pushed into Russian mainland, basically, and they've pushed into a town, they've secured the town, and now the Russians are having hard trouble repelling them. Now, I saw, again, guys, these are unconfirmed, I can't confirm them, but what I saw on various social media platforms is the Ukrainian troops, but the guys were talking in thick British and thick American accents. Now, I'm not for one second saying these are military. What I would say is there's a lot of ex-military who have gone over to Ukraine to be part of the International Foreign Legion. So while there's some speculation about who this is, it's, you know, or if this is even in um, in, the, in Russia itself, because this video could have been filmed anywhere. But if that is the case, and I'll just let me share this screen with you guys just quickly. So if that is the case, yeah. So if that is the case that the um, you know that the Russians are can't hold off this attack. Ukraine Russia latest massive offensive on Kursk leaves Putin struggling as he calls in reserve troops. So the article just goes on, guys, you know, and it, and it talks about the um, the situation unfolding. And of course, I'll put these in the um, you know in the links in the links below. But what I feel could happen now is if they've managed to push Western troops by Western troops, I mean Western trained troops who've got you know a good understanding of ground combat and infantry, then it's going to be really difficult for the Russians to repel these guys on, you know, because the Russian infantry, it's not really up to standard. Now, the way the Russians fight wars, they don't fight them. Again, you know, it's, it's like saying who's right and who's wrong. It's just the way the Russians fight the war. The Russians don't really invest in, individ in infantry. They don't invest in personal skills. They don't invest in the lower ranks. What they do through vast levels of corruption and incompetence, they just buy big machinery, so big tanks, big artillery, big guns and big bombs. Now, while that's good, it's not really good when you've got your infantry against other infantry. Because I've said all along, you know, a good infantry unit would would really would push through most Russian units because they don't know what to do when and when infantry is attacking them. So that could be the case that you've got at the moment. And I'm not saying it is. I'm saying there's a good a good case for speculation on it. Um, you know, from the videos that are circulating online of people with British accents, American accents now in that region, potentially. Again, you know, it's unconfirmed. You know, but if these guys can manage to push through, secure and hold this ground, then that leaves the Russians with the, what do the Russians do now? Because the Russians have not, the Russians are not um, geared up for fighting a war on their own ground. So the Russians have to make an, you know, they make, have to make a decision now. Do they artiller, put artillery in on their own towns, on their own villages? Guys, that is going to be a PR disaster for the Russians. But the Russians don't know any other way to fight. So I think what you're seeing now is you could be seeing the, and again, if this may or may not happen, you know, you're, I think you could be seeing the inroads now of a bigger conflict where the Russians need to decide, right, okay, my options are 
Do I use artillery on my own villagers because my infantry are not competent enough to take them? And guys, they're not. The Russian infantry are not competent at all. I don't care what anyone says. You know, they have mass numbers and they can take villagers by mass force, mass destruction and mass casualties, mass collateral. But they don't, they're, they're not even in the same, they're not even in the same, they're not even playing the same game as a Western military. So... The Russians have the choices now. Do they put artillery on their own villages? If so, can you imagine the PR of that? Can you imagine what the other villages in and around that area think? Can you imagine what the other villages in Russia think? And they'll think, right, okay, so the Ukrainians came to come into our village. They were really nice to us. They helped us. They didn't bomb us. And in response, the Russians flattened the village. Guys, I'm just speculating at this point. This is what could happen. Or then the Russians could think, okay, is it time to use tactical nuclear weapons? Because, guys, you know, it's very well documented that the Russian nuclear doctrine is very clear. If there's a threat to Russian mainland, if there's a, th uh, if there's a threat to the Russian motherland or whatever they call it, that's when they can take the safety catch off and use those tactical nuclear weapons. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying that's what the Russians are saying well, it can happen. And that's their nuclear doctrine. So let's go briefly to what's happening in, um, in Iran. Let me share this one with you as well, guys. Where are we? This one. So order by Iran's command Khamenei to punish Israel will be impl implemented. IRGC. Iranian officials say retaliation for killing Hamas's leader will be carried out in the best possible way. So there's the article there, guys. I'm not going to read it. You know, I'm just putting it in there because people think that this thing's, you know, calming down and it's not going anywhere. anywhere. But the reality is these, um, you know, these conflicts, they're still moving forwards and they're still pushing. It's just, I think, for whatever reason, there's been a delay. I thought it'd be this weekend. Well, we're not over the weekend yet. You know, and these guys, they are going to do this. They can't not do that. If you understand the Middle East and you understand, you know, politics out there, you need to be strong and you need to show strength to your population. If you don't show any strength, you lose credibility and you'll get overthrown. That's just how it works out there, guys. You know, it's not like... Um, it's not like in the UK where we have politicians say promises the world and say they're going to do all this stuff and then they get elected and just do the total opposite. No, you know, that, that, that doesn't happen. If people are coming up there, you know, being strong men, they have to follow that through. And, you know, we've seen and history has shown us that the Iranians will follow it through. They certainly have the capacity. They certainly have the allies and they certainly have the um, appetite to push this forwards. So that's only a matter of time that that happens. Now, Close to home, guys. The UK water. I'm not going to share this one. I'll just read it off the. Um, I'll just read it off the list. Water firms to be punished for years of sewage leaks. So, hang on. yeah. So months and months and months ago, when we started our channels, you know, one of the things I was always harping on about was the bad management of the UK water systems, the bad management of the UK water companies in general. And all they do is put their prices up. Now, this is because, first of all, the, the, the government shouldn't have sold these off because they sold them off to private companies. But what they didn't do is give any competition. And because the way the water system, the infrastructure is made, you can't, you know, you can't just phone up and change provider. It doesn't work like that. So you've got one provider. Now, whether that provider invests back into the system and gives you guys the best possible product, it doesn't matter because you still have to pay your bills and it's written in law. If you don't pay your bills, you'll get, you know, uh, like CCJs and negative credit. So it's kind of, you know, they've got a monopoly on that. And it, there's no incentive for these, excuse me, there's no incentive for these foreign companies, which a lot of them are. And I think I did a video and I said, I think. I think it's like 15% of the of the ownership of the UK water uh, companies. Nobody, they can't trace where 15% of the water companies are. Anyway, you know, I've lots of videos about this, but I'll put the link in the description. But basically, the water companies now, not only are they giving you a bad service, giving you impure water, they're now pumping sewage into, you know, reservoirs, streams, rivers, you know, places of natural beauty. This wouldn't happen, guys, if this was a capitalist system and we had 
a system where people could choose their water provider. So I know what people are going to say, oh, look, this is what happens when you privatise things. No. Privatisation without choice isn't privatisation. Look at our mobile phones, for example. It's a real one. Yeah, look at our mobile phones. Look how they've advanced from like the old ones that you used to get, where you used to like beep, 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 and you get Snake as a game. They've advanced because people buy the better one. So if so, imagine now if you lived in if you lived in Yorkshire and you had to buy a, the Yorkshire mobile phone. You wasn't allowed to buy another one. You had to pay your Yorkshire mobile phone bill. You couldn't get around it. Is there any incentive for the Yorkshire, Yorkshire mobile phone company to increase, to make a better product? Is there any incentive for those guys to try new components, try a new screen, try new buttons, try a smart screen like this? Is there any incentive? No, we'd all be on the old Nokia beep, 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 beep ones because it, they would, Private companies maximise profit and capitalism is nothing without choice. So when you get choice, you get a better product and the consumer wins, guys, all the time. When you don't get choice, that's when we have the problems. And now you can look at the examples, the water company, the rail companies, you know, all these things where you buy a monopoly and nobody else can come in. The service goes down. It's, it's embarrassing. The, again, I'm slightly going off tangent here, guys. The rail system in the United Kingdom. It's an absolute disgrace. If you go to Eastern Europe, well, Europe in general, you know, the, the rail system, it's it's so much better and so much cheaper. And you you sit there on, on you know, you'll sit there on a train. For example, when I go to, um, when I go to Ukraine, I'll get the train from um, Krakow. And the train's fantastic. You know, there's a really nice car uh, buffet, uh, like a like a restaurant on there. You sit there; it's nice. You know, there's um, I think there's even Wi-Fi. You can plug your phones in. It's just a better experience. And it's like I don't know, twenty dollars to get to for like a four-hour train ride. Then you come to the UK, and it's like twenty dollars to go like ten minutes. It's, it's just ridiculous. You know, and that's because there's no choice. There's no, you know, and the government have given that to a private company. Now, again, you know, I don't want to get into the argument of, you know, do we have government oversight? Because I last said in my last video, the government can't spend money, right? And all those arguments are correct. We just need to manage it better, guys, all right? Anyway, so finally, on to the Falklands. Those of you who know, I've been keeping an eye on the Falklands for you guys because nobody else is. So the amount of oil that's been shared, uh, uh, found sorry, in the Falklands recently is unbelievable. So Argentina breathes a sigh of relief as Falklands' 120 million port plan hits stumbling block. Argentina summoned the British ambassador to the country in the spring to complain about some of the initiatives planned by the Falkland Islands. The government of the Falkland Islands has sacked Harland and Wolf as its preferred bidder to build the 120 million floating port. The Bel the Belf forgot to talk. The Belfast shipyard that built the Titanic. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. The Belfast shipyard that built the Titanic was granted in March the preferred bidder status for new projects, subject to agreeing a financial contract pricing. Now. The significance of this that probably, well, I can guarantee you nobody's made. Now, if the Brit if, if Britain are planning on, you know, exploiting these oil resources, and guys, you know, just quickly, if you've not been following my channel, there's been a huge oil deposit found um, off the coast, well, in British territorial waters off the coast of the Falklands, which would make, which are twice the size of Saudi Arabia's, so which would make Britain a pretty rich country. Now, if you were going to exploit that, you would need sufficient portage. You'd be able, you'd need to be able to get ships to and from that region to then process that oil and move it on. Now, the West Falklands is a well, the Falklands in general. There's a, you know, it's a huge land area. You know, I think very soon you're going to see the Falklands become the most valuable real estate on the planet. So, 
that's the reality of the situation, guys, okay? So they're building this port. It's not said the port's cancelled. All it said is that their preferred bidder is not going to be... Um, it, it reached a stumbling block, I think it said. I'll put the links into the description. But you can see, you know, they're, they're Britain are building the infrastructure to take that oil slowly down there. Uh, recently, I did a video and I said that the airfield on the Falkland has been upgraded. It was, had, has just had a £20 million pound refit or a refurb. And again, I don't know how you refurbish an, air, an airfield for £20 million. You know, I'm sure I'm sure it's money well spent. But that's the situation as we are at the moment, guys. Okay, the Falklands, it's still moving on. And people are saying, oh, it's not. Guys, trust me, the amount of oil and resources that are in Antarctica, they will be exploited at some point. They have to be. It's inevitable. They have to be exploited. Now, is it going to be exploited soon? Is it going to be exploited later? You know, I, I don't know. But what you can see is Britain putting infrastructure in place because it's not going to. You know, it's not going to matter who can get the ships there. It's who, what can you do with that oil then? Because it's in the middle of nowhere. And the Falkland Islands is kind of, you know, a really good strategic place if you're going to set up a gas oil separation plant. So you would bring the, the raw crude, I guess. You'd bring it into the Falkland Islands. The Falkland Islands would then process that into diesel, petrol, whatever, and then they'd ship it on. So that's why it's really important, guys, right? The, you know, the Iranians have a similar have a similar system, uh, like a little island in the, uh, just off the Strait of Hormuz that they do, they have a, a gas oil separation island on the Strait of Hormuz and they do a similar thing with their oil. But anyway, guys, back to my original point, which was, which, you know, it's, it's happening and it's progressing and I don't see, I don't see the outcome to this yet, guys, in Ukraine, in the sense that there's now reports of NATO trained troops in that area, which have a, which have a, which are, predominantly really good at infantry stuff. The Russians can't take that village back with infantry, guys. It's not going to happen. You know, they don't have the capacity. You know, the amount of manpower they'd need to send in there to take NATO on force on force on an infantry level. And Putin knows this. Putin's generals know this. Of course, they're going to have some sort of skirmishes where they're sending their infantry. But, you know, it's not going to work. So the next step, that Putin, the, the, the decisions that Putin needs to make is... Do I send artillery into one of my own villages or do I use a low yield tactical nuclear weapon inside Ukraine to then force these guys back so they can't reinforce? Guys, I don't know what the outcome is, but I think they're going to be the decisions that Putin has to make. Guys, I am going to map to grid now and I will see you guys later.